unattainable You place the stars in the sky And you know them by name You are amazing, God All powerful, untamable All struck, we fall to our knees As we humbly grow Good morning, CPC. Welcome to worship on this 15th of November. We're in part three of our three-part sermon series on early church messaging. What were those things that the early church preached and taught that helped them to grow and move into their Christian world and can do the same for us? So let's get right to it today and let's begin with prayer. Please join me. God of insight and revelation. Open our hearts and our minds this morning to learn from you so that living waters might continue to flow in and through us in our ongoing journey with you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Times of time ring out the news, another day is through. Someone slipped and fell, was that someone you? You may have longed for added strength, for courage to renew. Do not be disheartened, for I bring hope.
Our scripture reading for this morning is again from Acts chapter 2, where we've been the previous two weeks and today. And remember from the last two weeks that the folks who've been in the upper room have now heard the message, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we continue on from there. Listen for a word from the Lord. So those who welcomed Peter's message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added to the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread together at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to us. Once baptism was accomplished by the early church and the Holy Spirit was received, spiritual growth began. But it didn't just happen automatically. On the contrary, it entailed discipline, devotion, and a change of lifestyle for many people. But don't get me wrong, their growth was also enjoyable and exciting. This notion that the Christian life must be drab and joyless and stern definitely did not come from the early church. No way. They, dare I say it, were having fun and fellowship and food. That's right. In fact, let's combine those three elements into one overarching reality community. That's right. The early believers enjoyed Christian community. And here's why. Because they were learning, loving, listening, and losing. Learning, loving, listening, and losing. First of all, they were learning. Our scripture reading for today says, they, the new believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. My friends, we simply cannot grow unless we are continually learning. I recently shared with one of you a phrase that I've often repeated, and here it is. Unless our input exceeds our output, our upkeep will be our downfall. I'll say it again. Unless our input exceeds our output, our upkeep will be our downfall. That is to say, we will burn out unless we continue learning and stoking the fire of growth in our Christian lives. And that goes for all of us. God created us for input. Input from God and input from others. Now, we sometimes suppose that we've been created for output, for production, for results. But listen, we cannot bless others until we've been blessed. And that means learning and receiving. For it is not a sin, it is not a sin to get things. Not if those things are knowledge of God and the world, understanding, and wisdom. We need all of that we can get. So the first thing and the continuing thing we need to practice in our Christian lives, says the early church, is learning. But how do we learn? Well, we expose ourselves to new information. We do not close ourselves off from it. Unfortunately, though, there is a philosophy out there today that says, surround yourself only with those ideas that you already believe in. 
with that information alone to which you already subscribe. Then you won't be confused. Then you won't be diluted. <laughs> For instance, this argument says, if you agree with what they are saying on MSNBC every day and night, then only watch MSNBC. Never tune in to Fox News, for instance, and hear what they are saying, for it will compromise you. It will hurt you. No, no, no. We must understand others' points of view if we ever are to fully understand them and to fully refine our own views. Our scripture reading says that the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That doesn't mean that they were therefore oblivious to other viewpoints. Not in the slightest. Indeed, their very awareness of other philosophies and ways of life kept them broad-minded in the best sense of that word. And nevertheless, kept them focused on and committed to their particular beliefs. And on God's Spirit working in their lives. Learning, therefore, was the first spiritual practice that was mandatory in the life of the believer. And it still is. The second spiritual practice employed by the early church was loving. Loving. Seems obvious, but we see this in several ways. We read that they devoted themselves to fellowship and the breaking of bread. Now please note, this does not mean the formal sacrament of communion. The breaking of bread might have led to the sacrament of communion, however. But the breaking of bread here is referring to taking meals together, to eating together. And know this, it is extremely difficult to harbor hurt or to build up animosities toward another person when you are eating with them. For instance, when I arrived at my former church, the session members were always at each other. They didn't trust each other, and they were forever complaining about one another and competing with one another. So I instituted a session dinner before each of our monthly meetings, which they'd never done before. Suddenly, like a miracle, all the sniping disappeared. They got out all their energy at the, meet at the dinner, they talked together, they shared, they got to know one another, and when we got to the business meeting itself, all the backbiting vanished. And those meetings were over in record time, which nobody complained about. Oh, we still disagreed with one another from time to time, and there were definitely differences of opinion. But remember, when you eat together, when you break bread together, when you love one another, differences dissolve. They dissolve, and real productivity can begin. They say in any effective group that there are four distinct stages that occur. Number one, obviously, forming the group. Number two, storming. That is, acknowledging and working out your differences with one another. Number three, norming. Namely, determining what are your norms or shared values. And finally, number four, performing, which is also known as productivity. Forming, storming, norming, and performing. Now, oftentimes, we want to jump straight from forming to performing. But it just doesn't work that way. We must go through all the stages. But that's another sermon for another time. For now, it's important for us to remember that the early believers were learning to love one another. To love one another. And as I mentioned, this loving took several forms. Consider this one from our reading. And I quote, All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, to any who had need. Now, we here at CPC have nearly completed our stewardship campaign for this year. 
So get your pledge cards in if you haven't yet returned them. The campaign was called the All In Stewardship Campaign because we have been encouraging full investment by our members, you and me, into the life of the church. Now, that's not easy during the virtual involvement that we've been experiencing during this time of COVID. But it's nevertheless possible. Consequently, of course, we've urged financial involvement and commitment. In other words, we've been doing great. Let's not stop giving. But in addition, we've advocated for participation of ourselves in the activities and the fellowship of the church via Zoom or through cards and emails or phone calls with one another. We've also urged sharing of our talents and gifts. Behind the camera across from me right now is somebody who shares every week their talent of making this worship service possible. And once again, I want to thank Tim for his commitment and for his dedication and stewardship of his talent to CPC. Thank you, Tim. And finally, we've encouraged engaging with and sharing of ideas with one another through reading books, through attending discussion groups, and to tuning in to webinars. All this to say, my friends, the church is still growing and giving and loving. And during this pandemic, we are especially listening to one another. I sense it, and I think you do too. We're working hard at that. And that, incidentally, is the third practice or discipline of the early church, listening. We are listening for special needs, the emotional and spiritual needs of our fellow church members and our brothers and sisters in Christ as we continue to slog through the circumstances surrounding this deadly disease that is threatening our communities and our world today more than it has ever before. Now, we may have read about Christians in other times or in former days who faced huge challenges and obstacles to their faith, and they did. Well, this pandemic and the other things that are happening in our world and in our nation today are a great challenge too for us. Let's never forget that or downplay it or minimize it. This is an extremely difficult and challenging time. And if you are feeling those challenges in particular, don't just try to handle them on your own. And I won't either. Let's share with one another what our needs are. Let's listen to one another so that we can help each other. Nobody's supposed to go it alone. We are the body. We are the church. Let's support and continue to encourage one another. For this could be a long, long winter. And we want to be here together for one another as the family of God. So we listen to one another's needs and we listen for the needs of the world as well. Just last Sunday at the Zoom coffee hour following worship, all in attendance were thrilled to hear about everything that our church and society committee is doing in the city of Ames and beyond. Indeed, listening for needs of the most needy and diligently and faithfully meeting those needs as a church. That kind of involvement makes one proud to be part of the CPC family. I know that I am, as we learn and listen and love. The final spiritual practice of the early church relates to all those first three, for it is the practice of losing. Now, we briefly touched on this last week, and we can observe this practice in the all-in attitude of the early believers, selling what they owned so that those with less could have an equal amount. That's what they did, breaking bread with one another regularly so that selfish possessions and viewpoints could be lost and losing suspicion and hatred and distrust of one another so that camaraderie and teamwork and sincere fellowship might be the result. As our reading points out, by doing these things, with glad and generous hearts, they were praising God and earning the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, it says, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved or 
made whole. That's what God did as a result of their practices, of their discipline, of their commitment. You see, my friends, our losing always results in gain. Let me say that again. Our losing always results in gain. Gain in understanding of God and of wisdom. Gain in the wholeness or salvation of ourselves and others. Gain in our mercy and compassion for our brothers and sisters in the world. Verse 43 of Acts chapter 2 reads, Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. And it's no wonder that there were wonders. And it's no secret that there were signs. Because when you practice learning, loving, listening, and losing, things will change. Systems will be transformed. And people will become whole. All those things will happen. And that doesn't just go for the first century church. It goes for now. It's not only for the early believers. Wholeness, salvation, transformation is for today too. Absolutely. Especially and particularly for today. Because although God surely acted in the past, God is not exclusively a God of the past. No. And although God will certainly act in the future, God is not primarily a God of the future. God is a God of today. Today. And guess what? We are here today too. You and I. Which means that God is all in. God is invested in working in and through us to affect change. That's good to know. It encourages my spirit every single day. Even through COVID. Even through endless virtual gatherings. Even through the upcoming loneliness and challenges of winter. Even through all those things, God is here, my friends. God is here. And together, through learning and loving and listening and losing, we will find that God whom the early church also experienced. An awesome sign, an incredible wonder. God be with your spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. May we thy bounties thus, as stewards true, receive, and gladly as thou blessed us, to thee our first fruits give. The captive to release, to God the lost to bring, to teach the way of life and peace, it is a Christ-like thing. And we believe thy word, though dim our faith may be, whate'er we do for thine, O Lord, we do it unto thee. Last week, after I performed my song for my mom, several of you said that I should do this more often, singing and playing my guitar. A couple of you even said, if, especially if you've written the song. So here I am again. Now, by no means will this be an every week appearance. I'm going to leave that to our music staff. But this is particularly relevant because it brings into play the themes from the sermon that you just heard about learning and growing and loving and listening and losing. The song's about 30 years old. When I was working with kids with the youth group at the Presbyterian Church in Great Falls, Montana, when I was in my 20s, a young high school girl from the group came to me uh, privately one day. She happened to be one of the pastor's daughters, and she said that she couldn't share with her father what she was telling me, that she had begun to live a life that was outside of what she wanted to, and that was embarrassing that she was doing things that weren't right, 
I'll let you fill in the blanks, uh, but that she wanted to change. She said in particular that she wanted to be like the tree that's described in Psalm 1, that bears its fruit in its season, that grows by the side of living waters, and whose leaf does not wither. That psalm also says that we're not to be standing in the path of sinners or sitting in the seat of scoffers or walking in the way of the wicked, but that that person who loves God and who will be blessed is the one who uh, dwells and thinks upon God's law all the time. So I counseled Jenny and prayed with her, and then I went home and wrote this song for her, and it's called Like a Tree. How can I be a tree that's planted by streams of living water If I am always growing in other fields instead of in yours, Lord And how can I feed others with your love until you first fed me By your word and in your church and down on my knees Blessed is she who does not stand in the path of sinners, nor sit with those who scoff endlessly, but her delight is in the law of the Lord, and she will be like a tree. be a tree that's planted by streams of living water if I am always growing in other fields instead of in yours Lord and how can I feed others with your love until you first fed me by your word and in your church and down on my knees blessed is she No sit with those who scoff endlessly, but her delight is in the law of the Lord, and she will be like a tree. Yes, she will be like a tree. receive the benediction. To the one who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before God's throne of grace, even Jesus Christ our Lord, be the honor, glory, power, and dominion forever and ever. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the love of God be with you and abide with you this day and every day. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you.